Okay, welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is our weekly Q&A show. You ask questions, we give you the answers. If you've got any questions, get involved in the comments underneath. Use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Uh, this week, we're gonna do things a little bit slowly. I'm gonna put a 15 minute timer on my head and I'm gonna answer as many questions as possible. These are all questions that I copied and pasted from an Instagram post I made recently. It's 95 in total. I'm gonna get nowhere near that. But when you hear the crowd booing, that means the show is over. Okay, so I'm setting my alarm for 15 minutes time. Three, two, one, go. Okay, so first up, why do inner tubes smell of fish? Um, some people think it's because of the crushed powder that's in the inside, they think it's reminiscent of fish bones, um, but it's actually made from calcium carbonate, so that is found in fish bones and other materials, so it could be that, but it could also be some of the oils that are found in the rubber. A lot of the rubber is made from recycled and repurposed stuff, and it is fish oils and stuff, so it could be that. Um, local bike shop or online? A bit of both, I think. We wouldn't be here without local bike shops, so you do need those, and you have to support them, and they're the best, to be honest, but sometimes it's not always possible to get to them so you do need online as well. Uh, next up I've noticed that when I ride I find myself reaching too far forward and end up hunching my shoulders as a result I get tightness and pain in my neck and in my traps. Uh, is this a bike fitment issue or a rider position issue? Um, okay well position is everything you've not said what size bike it is so um, I can't tell you if it's too small or too too big really but um, uh, basically if your bike is too long you're going to end up stretching it too much if you're too hunched up then that could be what you're describing so try and experiment with your existing position maybe try and raise your stem up and down roll your bars back and forwards and try your saddle position see if any of that remedies it but uh, without knowing your bike size I can't help you uh, what are the most cool, useful accessories to mount on water bottle bosses beside a water bottle cage? Uh, you could do a multi tool, you could do an inner tube, you could do CO2 cartridges uh, or a pump, I guess. Uh, what are the first tech things you're always going to do to your own bike? Uh, stuff manufacturers missing, hacks that keep you getting in trouble. Um, okay, first up, I'll always do my cockpit position. I'm really particular about the height. I run a 780 to an 800 bar, depending on bike. This one, a 780 on cross country, 800 on everything else. I run full rise on everything else. I run low rise on XC. I'll take my time doing that. A uh, bit of cable routing. I want to make sure everything's nice and quiet, neat. They're as short as possible, but don't hinder any movement. A uh, bit of chain silencing. I hate noisy bikes. Uh, bikes? Noisy bikes, even. Uh, and also, I do a base setting on a suspension. I just do the correct sag and a rough sort of borderline uh, compression and rebound. Then I'll go and ride it and do a bit of a shakedown. Then from the back of that, I'll know if I want to put volume spaces in and do more advanced stuff. I'm currently having some pain in my hands, which starts in my little finger, uh, metacarpals, and runs down to the couples on my wrist. Okay, bad. I've got a hardtail with 70, 40 bars, no rise, and a 50 mil stem. Can you help? Okay, so your bars are either too low for you or they're too far away. Any weight that's on your hand, that's how it gets there. Uh, of course, you could adjust saddle position a tiny bit, but really, uh, it sounds like they're too low and possibly too far away. But you say you've got a 50 mil stem, so it's doubtful for that. So I think it's the no rise. Uh, you want to try and rise them up a little bit. See if you can put your stem a little bit higher in the actual on the steerer tube if not see if you can borrow a bar from a friend just to try out before committing to spending any money but get your bars up a bit that should help um, also look into some different handlebar grips you might find that uh, a more comfy pair of grips will actually make it a lot easier on your hands because that does make a big difference can you fit bottle cage screws to a frame by drilling holes in it if it doesn't already have bottle cage bulbs? Uh, no, uh, forget it. Some people tell you can do it. Um, we should definitely tell you to not do that. But you can get a thing called the Fidlock system. Um, they do them for bottle cage bolts, but they also do want to strap onto the frame so you can fit them anywhere. They're really good. What makes suspension design so expensive? I noticed that full suspension frame and shock may cost somewhere in the region a thousand pounds, but you can get a decent hardtail for 300 quid. Why? Uh, well, hardtails, essentially, they don't have many moving parts. They're a, sink, a simple frame, or a far more simple frame. They're a lot easier and a lot faster to manufacture. You think how many components and intricate parts are, uh, are in a full suspension frame? You've got the pivot point, you've got the big shock yoke area, you've got the BB yoke area, you've got your hardware, the cartridge bearings, the bearings, the bushings, um, the pivots, loads of small components on the bike that are all made and they all take a lot longer to design, a lot longer to manufacture. Uh, so that's where the money is going. And that's not even without talking about the shock absorber as well. So shock absorbers can cost anything up to a thousand pounds depending on what you're going for. Um, so a lot of money involved there. Um, can the derailleur wear out or only the jockey wheels wear parts? Uh, jockey wheels will always wear, you can get ones with replaceable bearings or bushings on those, so that's good. But no, the derailleur itself can wear out, of course. Uh, you think the derailleur is basically a parallelogram, so in time, the more you use that, it is going to develop a bit of play. So uh, don't expect it to be a derailleur for life, even if you don't bash it on something. 
Okay, first ride on my new bike, got a stick in the rear derailleur and broke the lever for the clutch on a Shimano XT 12 speed. Can you replace it yourself? Yes, I need to do that exact same thing. I've done it on my Canyon Lux cross country bike. I uh, went through some shrubbery of some kind and it snagged it and it, and it snapped it off. Uh, you do have to take the clutch apart. You have to take the top off. In fact, I'll do a little video on that because I need to actually do that myself and order one. The part is about four quid, about four and a half euros, five dollars ish, uh, quite easy to get online. Um, I've got a 2018 RockShox sector and I can't see how to take the lowers off for service. Can you help me out? Uh, fundamentally, all suspension forks, you take them apart in the same way. They all have slightly different amounts of oil and stuff, so you will need to check the amount that's in yours. But essentially, you have an upper leg uh, and it's part of the crown and you have the lower legs that slide onto them. On the inside of those uh, upper legs, there's basically piston rods or damper shafts, basically, and they're attached to the outside of the fork. You have bolts or nuts on the bottom. You basically need to undo those and shock them a little bit to make sure the rods aren't attached on the inside and then you can slide off those lower legs but there will be oil and mess coming out of them um, i'm gonna put a link in the description underneath for a lower leg service so you can just see um, the principle is the same on all forks although the intricacies are slightly different amongst different brands um, what's that you're using on the last picture for cables? Looks neat. Uh, okay, so that's the cable on the Instagram post I said to ask for questions. Um, it's off my specialized e-bike um, and it's actually just uh, the little specialized cable clips. Nice and simple, it came with a little bag of them. Really good little things, although I don't think they're made by specialized. I think you can get them online, uh, places like Wiggle, Chain Reaction, any of those sort of online places. Uh, or your bike shop, if you're gonna have a little rummage, but at the moment we can't really get to bike shops. Um, although you can get to some of them, so it's worth asking. What's a good way to keep the spaghetti of cables on the front of the bike, Nick? Um, well, see the last question, to be honest. Um, you wanna limit your cable length, the outer hosing, of course. You want them as short as possible without hindering any movement. And what I mean by that is, you need the, in a crash situation, the bars need to be able to spin fully without ripping anything out and damaging anything. So allow for that, but have them as short as possible within that, and they're gonna look a lot neater. Also, just consider the routing. The way they come, if they've got external routing or internal routing, might not necessarily be the best for you. Bearing in mind that some riders run uh, front brake on the right, some run it on the left. So uh, correlate that, basically, and it will look nice and tidy. Um, I really fancy giving clipless pedals a go, and I've seen there are a few different brands who produce pedals that do both uh, flats on one side, clipless on the other. Is it worth me dipping my toe in these, or should I go all out? Now, straight in, no kissing, don't bother with those. Uh, they're really good if you're commuting to work or something, and sometimes you might want to do a bit of a performance ride, and other days you just want to go in in your regular shoes or trainers. But really, in an off-road situation, they're no good. You're going to get confused. Stick to flats or get all the way in and go in with clips. Uh, hot weather storage question for coming summer. What possible damage can I cause to a carbon frame and components by leaving the bike in a hot car for extended periods of time on a hot summer's day? What components more sensitive to heat? Uh, do you think covering the bike, I oh, flip it, I'm not reading all that. Um, yeah, basically uh, carbon is safe to heat. I think that they do make carbon disc rotors, so they're gonna get extremely hot. And I think most frames are tested up to, uh, I think it's about 400 Fahrenheit, or something crazy like that. Don't quote me on it, but it is extremely hot. Now you are gonna get anomalies if your frame, maybe the lacquer has worn away on the top that's protecting the carbon itself, or if you scratched it and scuffed it. I actually had a rim, a really, really old Eastern rim, and I think it was a prototype rim, so it was nothing to do with the, the fault of this, but it was scratched to hell. It was a really badly damaged rim, and actually it exploded in the back of a car. Um, Russell Burton, the photographer, if he's watching this, he will know about this, because the tire sealant went all over the back of his really nice transporter van. Sorry about that, Russ. Uh, next up, can I put 29 inch wheels on a 27.5 plus bike? When you buy them, 29 comes with 140 travel. Uh, basically, there is a little bit of difference. So the traditional plus size was actually with a three inch tire and the outside diameter of a three inch tire was about the same as a, a 29 inch wheel running a 2.25 tire. Yeah, now so regular 27.5 plus now is using the 2.8, so they are slightly smaller. So you're gonna get about 10 mil difference. Uh, so yeah, you can do that, but you do have to factor that in. Uh, or you can get around that by trying to pick a slightly bigger tire. They are available out there. Um, uh, yeah, there you go. How can I check if my 3x9 2003 blur can be converted to 1x12 or more? Uh, yeah, of course it can. It's just gears and transmission. You could buy all of those components separately. You could turn, you could basically get a slightly bigger middle chamber, provided you've got enough clearance, get rid of the two outer ones, and you could fit a 10, 11, 12 on the rear. The only thing you might need to change will be the free hub body on your rear hub. And there is a chance you might need a different wheel or a different hub because it might not be compatible depending on which option you go for. There's loads of options out there. Uh, so yeah, you can, you can go one by and bring your bike bang up to date. Great bike that. 
What size chainring would you recommend for a 11.46 rig set being used on a giant Fathom, mainly gravel rides and some XC stuff? Um, how big are your heels? How strong are your legs? What sort of cadence do you like? Do you like to push the gear? Do you like to spin a gear? Dude, you're not telling me um, everything here. Um, I would probably run a 38 on a gravel bike if it's my choice, because I'm quite happy to just get on with it and do it. But that might not work for you. You might want to run a 34 or even smaller than that. Sorry, you need some more information with that. The best advice would be to um, get in touch with your local bike shop and see if they do group rides. Of course, we're not supposed to be doing group rides as such now. And the next availability, go out with some of those guys and see what they're running. Ask them about it, see what the local routes involve, and you'll soon sort of figure out what works best for you. Uh, good luck with that. If my bike's getting too small and I don't want to spend a ton on a new bike, can I get a longer stem to counteract it? Uh, well, within reason. Bearing in mind that the longer the stem goes, the nearer your body weight is going to be to over the front wheel axle or even in front of it. If it goes in front of it, forget it, your handling is going to be all over the place. You want your body weight on the bike to be in the middle of the two wheels. Think about the sort of pendulum effect. So, in an ideal world, you want this triangle, so your head and the two wheel axles, you basically want that to be an equilateral triangle. If those wheel axles are close together and you're really high up, um, you're going to be like an isosceles and you're going to be all top heavy like a pendulum on that bike and that's going to be awful handling um, so you do not want to be doing that so within reason if you've got say a 50 on there and it's not long enough you could go up to a 70 maybe an 80 at a push um, so yeah i probably wouldn't go longer than 30 mil uh, certainly don't go over 100 mil otherwise your bike will be horrendous um, no, there you go uh, and also another thing to say about that the more weight you've got on that front wheel if it's got short wheelbase uh, you've got more chance of pitching over the bars and more chance of losing the front end if your weight is behind that wheel axle you're going to be in control of it and you'll still be able to weight it but from a safer position that's why longer wheelbase bikes are really beneficial for that I cannot get my gears, a SRAM Eagle GX group set, indexed properly. When I set them up in the stand, they shift fine. When I go riding, they're all over the place. Jumping, not shifting. Uh, sometimes it takes a double shift to get it to move down. Yeah, I've had that before, that's annoying. And I have to shift back up again, so da -da -da. Um, I've checked all the usual standard setup things with limited screws and B-tension, and seemingly fine. Any thoughts on what's causing this? Age, chain stretch, worn cassette, etc. Um, it could be anything. If it's a suspension, well, it could be ghost shifting. Uh, maybe so. Maybe your inner cables are sticking on the inside of the outer housing. Maybe your outer housing route is a little bit kinked, so the cables aren't able to slide through it. Um, maybe your outer housing is a bit short in places, so when the suspension is moving, it's either compressing it or it's actually pulling out of the housing slightly. There are loads of small things it can be. Cable tension is king. You have to make sure that works correctly. So the best thing to do would be to take that out, and I would flush out all the housing, check it's all the correct length as well. There's no need to replace your outer housing just yet uh, but perhaps you might want to look at replacing the inner cable and while you're at it do a full re-index of your gears check your stops check your b screw or your b tension make sure the jockey wheels or the pulley wheels are rotating smoothly um, just take your time with it. it's going to be a link to mastering gear setup in the description underneath uh, good luck with that one it takes a while but it is worth doing uh, next up uh, uh Donnie, love the show and your time my question i want to be I want to become a bike. Oh my god, getting tongue twisted here, doing these fast. I want to become a bike mechanic. It looks fun and I love the challenges and keeping up with new technology, but what advice would you like to give? Um, basically, it's principles. So start, the, start with your own bike. Uh, learn the gears, learn how indexing works, learn how all the bearings and stuff work, because fundamentally all bikes are the same. They just have more or slightly different systems. You can apply uh, the indexing on a five speed system up to a 12 speed system. It's Pretty much the same. There'll be a few tips and tricks and some different things and some different nuances between brands and systems, but you can just pick that up along the way. And as soon as you take on those little nuggets of information, they're, they're there, they're tucked away. And you'll be like, you know, forever working on the bike. Like, oh yeah, I remember those old old tram nine speed systems. I, I know the little trick there for getting the B screwed. You know, that's how it is. Uh, just take your time. The longer you do it, the more you're gonna learn. Um, I learn new stuff literally every single day. I'm still learning. Uh, I think if you don't learn every day, don't learn something every day. It's a pretty boring day to be honest. Uh, well, what's the Chunky stem, Doddy. Uh, so that was in the Instagram post. That is, uh, that was this fella. That's an Azonic hammer, um, an awful looking thing. But actually, it was a predecessor to kind of what I was talking about at the time, which was the Mondraker stem. And uh, you can find out all about that in the video that's going to be in the link underneath this, uh, all about that Mondraker bike, which kickstarted the long geometry and the long low slack evolution. Really interesting video. Check it out. Um, Dodster, loving the show and the top lip accessory. Oh, thank you. It's still here. I meant to shave it off actually, so I just haven't got around to it. Um, 
recently bought a new Canyon Spectral with 160 RockShox Pikes. I've been fiddling with a setup and I feel great on big hits, but when I'm on fast, small bumpy bits, it feels like I'm holding on to a jackhammer. The bars seem to vibrate like mad, which can get a bit uncomfortable after a while. Are there any suggestions and setup that I might miss? I've fitted two volume spaces, which can help stop the forks diving. I weigh 96 kilos. I'm using just over three quarters of my travel. Um, okay, basically, there's a few things you could do. It sounds like they could be a little bit firm, you know? Uh, you're adding in the volume spaces, you can afford to take out a little bit of pressure. Um, it could be a, a little bit too much in the low speed compression. It doesn't sound like you've got too many volume spaces in because you put too many in, it can feel like a spike a little bit. Um, I would say tire pressure probably. Tire pressure has the biggest effect on your suspension. Literally two PSI difference can make a monumental difference. Uh, and one last thing, check your handlebar grips. If you've got really thin or really firm handlebar grips, they're gonna transmit all of that shock and that can make a massive difference and you can mistake it for what your fork is actually doing. Uh, check all those things before you go back to square one. Um, I just bought my dream bike, a Santa Cruz Nomad, an old one. Uh, needs a little bit of TLC today. I've switched to tubeless, got new flats and grips, want to know whether to do brake pads and a bleed next or service the front and rear shock. They're both needing to be done. Um, just do everything. Just take your time. There's no need to rush these things. Uh, ride the bike, the things that need attention, do them first. If it's brakes, that's safety related, so do your brakes first. Uh, next up, why do companies design bikes with slack seat angles? Are there any advantages? What are the disadvantages of a steep seat angle? Okay, so a steep seat angle is really beneficial for getting your climbing position forwards. Great for steep climbs, even better for steep climbs on longer travel bikes. On a cross-country bike, for example, um, a slacker angle isn't that much of an issue because you're regularly tra- Oh, we're out of time. I'll finish that one. Um, basically, on a cross-country bike, um, it's quite comparable to road bike for position-wise. You want to be able to jump between the two because a lot of cross-country pros will train on road bikes. That's why it tends to be slacker on XC bikes and it tends to be steeper on more enduro bikes because it makes climbing on a big, steep bike better. The downside of having a steep seat angle on, on a big travel bike like that is you accordingly have to make the rest of the bike much longer, which is why you don't really see it cross-country because you don't really need the bike with that much wheelbase. You want to keep it light and maneuverable. Uh, there we go. That was a uh, rushed Ask uh, GMBN Tech. Hopefully you enjoyed all those questions. I don't know how many I answered, but um, I'll do the rest in the same style. If you like the format, if you can even understand what I was saying, I didn't even hear myself think there. But uh, thanks for hanging around. See you later, guys.